Well, good morning, friends, and blessings in Jesus. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus truly is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is June the 28th of the year 2017, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you feeling blessed this morning? If not, it may be that your mind is upon the things below as opposed to the things above. So let me remind you simply to begin to consider the things of God. Be still and know that He is God. Count your blessings and allow your heart to ascend in praise. And friends, I promise the Spirit of the living God will begin to indwell you and move within you in a way that you'll begin to feel blessed as you, a child of God, should. Well, we're going to continue our study in the book of First Enoch, and today we are in chapter 63. Now, we'll, as always, place a link in the description box so you can follow along with us. If you have your Bible, we will be referring to the Bible on several instances. So if you have the book of First Enoch open in front of you and your Bibles, let's begin at First Enoch chapter 63. It says, In those days shall the mighty and the kings who possess the earth implore him to grant them a little respite from his angels of punishment to whom they were delivered, that they might fall down in worship before the Lord of Spirits and confess their sins before him. Just a little bit too late though. Verse 2 continues, They shall bless and glorify the Lord of Spirits and say, Now listen to the praises that will come forth from these sinful, unrighteous people who have lived lives that have been unpleasing to the Lord and now are standing before him with no excuses and they have to give account for their lives. Listen to what they say. Blessed is the Lord of Spirits and the Lord of Kings and the Lord of the mighty, and the Lord of the rich, and the Lord of glory, and the Lord of wisdom, and splendid in every secret thing is thy power from generation to generation, and thy glory forever and ever. Deeper all thy secrets and innumerable, and thy righteousness is beyond reckoning. We have now learnt that we should glorify and bless the Lord of kings and him who is king over all kings. That would be Jesus Christ. And again, their praises, their confessions are just a little bit too late. But these are the mighty of the earth. These are the kings of the earth. These are the princes of the earth. This isn't speaking about the common man who's struggling just to make it through day to day like you and I probably These are people whose money is their God, and they have no need for the living God, the Most High right now, because their money meets all their needs. But you take away all their money, and just like on that day of the great crash of Wall Street back in the 30s, 40s, you'll see them plummeting out of windows because their God is gone. And yet on this day, the Bible tells us that they will say, we have now learned, we have now learned, that we should glorify and bless the Lord of kings and him who is king over all kings. Friends, what a privilege we have today, not to wait until then, but to lift up praises unto the Most High, unto the Lord Jesus, for all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do. And we can say, even now, blessed is the Lord of spirits and the Lord of kings, and the Lord of the mighty, and the Lord of the rich, and the Lord of glory, and the Lord of wisdom, and splendid is he in every secret thing. His power is from generation to generation, and his glory forever and ever, and together the people of God say, hallelujah. And he continues, and he says, deep are all thy secrets, and they are innumerable. You know, Paul echoed this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, when he said, For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
The writer of the psalm says in Psalm 92, verse 5, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Isaiah tells us in chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts, speaking of the Lord's thoughts, this is God speaking, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And yet, friends, we have the privilege and the blessing to be able to attach our thoughts to his thoughts, our feelings to his feelings. What moves him now moves us. And when we are tempted to act out in the flesh, his spirit speaks to us and reminds us that we are to exhibit his character, his love, his ways unto the world around us. We are to represent him. And when we see those who take his name not representing him well, we have every right to rebuke him. For the writings of Solomon tells us open rebuke is greater than secret love. And so we need to hold one another accountable to representing our Lord in the proper way so that there's something different seen about us and we are lights unto the world. Amen? He continues in the end of verse 5, back to 1st Enoch, and he says, Would that we had rest to glorify and give thanks and confess our faith before his glory? And now we long for a little rest, but we find it not. We follow hard upon and obtain it not. And light has vanished from before us. Now, I don't know if this is referring to that there will be hard labor I don't know if they will be so anxious that every fiber of their body will be tense, that they will be experiencing great stress, therefore allowing them unrest. But certainly they are seeking just a moment of relaxation and they cannot have it. And it says light has vanished from before us and darkness is our dwelling place forever and ever. Now, friends, it's very difficult to become terrified in the daylight. But you put a person in a place of darkness with mysterious sounds occurring all around them and their imagination is left to run wild and absolute fear sets in. And we know both from the Bible and common sense that most of the works of darkness take place in the night. Evil comes out in the night. And yet they will be bound in this darkness forever and ever. Verse 7, For we have not believed before him, neither did we glorify the name of the Lord of spirits, nor glorified our Lord. But our hope was in the scepter of our kingdom and in our glory. That should remind you of Daniel chapter 4 when we are given the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And basically what's taking place here is Nebuchadnezzar walks out on the porch of his palace. He looks over his kingdom and he begins to take glory in what he has accomplished. And listen to what this small Bible story tells us. Let's begin at verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty and while the word was in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying o king nebuchadnezzar to thee it is spoken the kingdom is departed from thee and they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and seven times or seven years shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and he did eat grass as oxen. Now friends, this is a king of a nation and he is on all fours roaming and foraging through the grass eating like animals and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws and at the end of the days or the seven years 
I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to bring low or to abase. Friends, I got to tell you, I wish that God still worked in many of the ways he worked in the Old Testament. And my prayer would be that the mighty of this earth, all the kings of Wall Street, the presidents, the princes, the queens, the kings, that as each one began to take glory and put their confidence and trust in the things of this world, that they would be stricken like Nebuchadnezzar, and at least in this lifetime, they would come to praise him and to know him and to glorify him and to extol him, and their souls would be saved from such a terrible destiny that without such a vision, without such a reality in their life, they're going to be as the kings of the earth that we're reading about in First Enoch. And when they do glorify him, it will be too late. We continue in First Enoch in verse 8. It says, In the day of our suffering, now the kings and the exalted ones are continuing to make their plea. It says, In the day of our suffering and tribulation, he saves us not. Why? Because it's too late. They had their chances. They heard the truth. They knew the truth. But they decided to do what they wanted to do instead of what God wanted them to do. And it says we find no respite for a confession. There's no place for confession. That our Lord is true in all his works and in his judgments and in his justice. They know they're getting what they deserve. And though their pleas of confession and their pleas for mercy go out, they know that exactly what the Lord does, he is righteous in his judgments and in his justice. And his judgments have no respect of persons. You remember when Peter told us in Acts chapter 10 verse 34 that God is no respecter of persons? Well, that's what these kings and exalted ones are saying here. They're saying he's righteous in his judgments because he has no respect of persons. He's judging each according to the way they live their lives on this earth. Verse 9, we pass away before his face on account of our works. Again, there's no place for excuses. They will not be able to, because they know that their, their hearts, their souls, their lives are transparent before the Lord. And they cannot hide anything from him. They cannot lie to him. And all of our sins are reckoned up in righteousness. Verse 10, now they shall say unto themselves, Our souls are full of unrighteous gain, but it does not prevent us from descending from the midst thereof into the burden of Sheol, into the burden of the grave, into the burden of this tormented place that we call hell. And apparently there's a great burden that will be carried there, and we cannot speculate to what it is, but it certainly will be the opposite of rest which is what the people of God will be enjoying in the kingdom of heaven and upon the new earth. Verse 11 continues, And after that their faces shall be filled with darkness and shame before the Son of Man. That's Jesus. And they shall be driven from his presence. And the sword shall abide before his face in their midst. Just like the angels bore swords to block the entrance back into the Garden of Eden after man fell, so shall there be a sword that will abide before the face of the Lord Jesus in the midst, separating these people from his presence forever. Verse 12, Thus spake the Lord of spirits, and he said, This is the ordinance and judgment with respect to the mighty in the kings 
and the exalted and those who possess the earth before the Lord of spirits. And that brings us to the end of chapter 63. But friends, if you are a child of the living God, if your sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus, if you've been forgiven and granted mercy on his behalf of what he did for you, you have every reason to praise and extol and glorify the King of Kings today for the very fact that you will not fall into the lot of these men but that you will bow your head before him. You will lay the crown that he has placed upon your head at his feet, realizing that there is no reason that you should be granted such mercy. And if your fate was to stay bowed before him in worship and throughout all eternity, foregoing all the other's pleasures and splendor of heaven, friends, it would be enough. Because the problem we so often face here on this earth is so many things become about us. But in that place, in his kingdom, everything will be centered upon Jesus Christ. And we will live in a constant, perpetual state of worship and adoration unto and because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And together, the people of God say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Human words aren't enough to give him the praise that he so deserves. And so we are left simply to say, Hallelujah. All glory and praise to the Lamb. Well, friends, I love you. I'm so thankful that you decided to spend a few moments with us today. I pray that your heart has been lifted. I pray that your mind has been blessed. And I pray you'll walk in your journey today with your mind upon the things of his kingdom, upon the things of his person, and that you'll be taken into secret places by your Lord, through his spirit, into places that have been reserved only for those that belong to him. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.